Okay, so who came with family? Raise your hands. This is awesome. And it was actually a trick question, because if there's anybody who didn't raise their hand, everybody came here with family. Uh, and that's part of the talk today, is that, that everybody here is related to each other. This is, in a zoo, it's the place we come to contemplate how we're tied into the web of life around us, not just to fellow humanity, but to beyond humanity as well. And the talk today, we're going to get into a really neat part of our own genomes that reveals this. And I think of this as our magic genes, our most informative genes. I'm going to tell you why they obsess me um, for, for many reasons, but there's a really ticklish one that has to do with the zoo today, and I think John may have alluded to it in the introduction. So anybody on the screen here, anybody recognize the, the little tree diagram? Who drew that tree? Does anybody know? Darwin. So the original Chuck D, Charles Darwin, uh, was the, the person who drew this tree, and he was kind of figuring out in his head what trees might look like historically, evolutionary trees, as his, his ideas were bubbling up. Now Darwin himself, if we look in his family tree, he had a really interesting forebear. So he might have come to this talk with his grandfather. Uh, his name was Erasmus. So and Erasmus was a naturalist himself. So there, there was ideas in the air uh, in Darwin's time. And when he talked with his grandfather, his grandfather might have floated one of these ideas. His idea was that all life might share what he called one living filament. And this was very prescient in some sense. It was way before we knew anything about genetics. But of course, if we fast forward to, to today, we can think of the filament within us, within our cells, that, that DNA, those chromosomes that make up our genomes, as that living filament that ties life together from now, way back into the past. And if you think about flipping those, those chromosomes to make that filament, we could ask a question. Where in our DNA is most informative? Where, where does it tell us the most about us? There's one part of our genomes that I want to show you, and I'm going to see if you can spot it. So I'm going to show you a bunch of charts that scientists use to, to scan across our genomes and say, where does it matter what spelling somebody carries for a disease? So for typhus, for typhoid fever, for example, um, the, there's a little uh, spot, there's a peak there. Uh, if we slow down here, so uh, there's a peak there on the sixth chromosome, you can see. Let's slow down as we go through here. So if you look at the sixth band in every one of these little slides here, you'll see there's a really strong peak for these various diseases. They could be infections like who gets typhus, who gets HIV-1, uh, who gets he hepatitis C? Who gets liver damage if they take a particular drug in this case? We go forward one. Who gets multiple sclerosis? There's the same peak showing up. And so on that, that chromosome six, if we just keep going forward, we'll see all kinds of different diseases. Bedgett's disease, a mystery disease of the Silk Road. Narcolepsy, uh, one of our speakers later today has narcolepsy. And it's, uh, it traces to the same part of our genomes, some kinds of tumors as well. Even kind of interesting, uh, not so crucially important stuff like hair loss, and, uh, and sometimes very important things like peanut allergies. Same part of chromosome 6. So this part of chromosome 6 turns out to be really interesting. It's also exactly the same part of our genomes that we screen for transplant match, for trying to find that crucial person who matches you if you're a patient in need of, say, bone marrow or a kidney. It's the part of our genomes that's so rare to match, and it tells us so much about many, many questions. And this part of our genomes is called HLA. It's a little cluster of genes. There on chromosome 6, we can see if we blow that chromosome up. And I think of it as like a little prism. It opens light onto many, many questions in our lives. So it makes proteins that are kind of like hands. There are five genes. Think of them as the five fingers on each hand, two copies, mom and dad's copies that they gave you. Those help us help our cells sense the world within us, sort of figure out what's going on inside and how do we respond to it? Is there a threat? Is there a bug that's in us, a bacterium, a virus, et cetera? Is there an allergen? Should we not, not respond? And those genes help us decide how to respond. They strongly shape our health and our health outlook for many questions that we just looked at. And they are, in many ways, the epicenter of diversity in our genomes. They're where our genomes vary more, letter for letter, than just about anywhere else. That's why it's so hard to find that match for somebody who needs a bone marrow transplant because they vary so much. And that variation is incredible. So let's, let's go forward a little bit here. And let's look, look at, let's imagine that we took everybody's copies of chromosome 6, not just in the room here, not just in, in the, the other people who are watching uh, in, in uh, remote audiences as well, but everybody on the planet. So all s roughly 7 billion times 2, so roughly 15 billion copies of chromosome 6. 
and we pick a random letter, a spot on that chromosome, not an HLA, somewhere else. We ask, what's the family tree look like for all those copies? How are they related to each other if we go back in time? And if we make a tree, let's go forward one little uh, slide, there we'll see that, that that's what the tree would look like roughly. That's just 1,000 copies there. But it's a very complex tree. The tips are us. The, our copies are sort of the fruit at the tips. The root is back in time. And there, that root goes back about a million years to one person's copy that gave rise to all of our copies for that typical site in a, on a, a chromosome. Now, that's, about a, that's more or less a million years wherever you look in our genomes, except for spots like HLA that are really, really mysterious. So HLA, we have to actually shrink down the tree that we just looked at. And we have to instead look at a tree that instead goes about 40 million years deep. So if the, if the original tree for a regular spot in our genomes is like a Christmas tree, the tree for HLA is like a giant redwood. It would go through the roof here, way into the sky. It's incredibly deep. And that 40 million years, if you think about it, takes us back to Darwin's tree and what he was thinking about evolutionarily. So he was trying to contemplate where, where humanity and other animals and plants and everything on the planet came from. And he was thinking about that tree. His, his thinking evolved. And here we have another, another uh, older male primate. This is Kitombe here in the zoo. He's also got a branch. He's thinking about the tree as well. And Darwin's thinking on trees evolved to the next picture of a tree, which was his first attempt at understanding the tree of primates. So how are, are people related to other primates? And he thought that he thought we were closely related to chimpanzees, to gorillas. He didn't c quite get the tree exactly right but he got close. If we look at the tree, this is how we typically think of it. So let's, let's look at our tree. We've got uh, some chimps, chimps and bonobos on the left there. We've got people in the middle there. We've got uh, our gorillas on the, on, uh, so we've got Kiki and Kitombe here in the zoo, and we've got orangutans on the far right. How are they related in a tree? Well, typically, for a typical spot in our genomes, we can advance the slide. This is what the tree would look like. Most people are more closely related to each other more gor most gorillas are more closely related to each other. And then they come together at the, the taxon level deeper in time. But for HLA, remember, we're going so deep that that 5 million year depth that separates us from chimpanzees, or the 6 or 7 million that separates us most of the time from Kitombe and Kiki, that's just like a moat we can jump across. It's not even there. It's 40 million years deep. So if we look at the HLA tree, we could actually be, you, each of us is more closely related to some gorilla in HLA than to some other people. Each gorilla is more closely related to some of us in HLA than to some other gorillas. Okay, think about that. It's kind of crazy. You're, you and the person next to you, you're closely related in most of your genomes. But in HLA, you could be really, really far apart, and you could actually be closer to Kiki, and that person could be closer to Kitombe. Okay? So if we forward to the last slide, that could even come to your family. So let's say that you have a sibling, and you and your sibling got different copies of HLA from your parents. So you got copy one from mom, copy one from dad. Your sibling got copy two from mom, copy two from dad. That means you could actually be closer to Kitombe in HLA than to your own sibling. And your own sibling could be closer to Kiki than to you. Okay? This is a new kind of understanding of how, of how the web of life and the trees that go deep into our past tie us together, not just with each other as people, but even beyond those boundaries sometimes. And the talks we're going to hear today, I think, are going are to resonate with that. They're about our responsibilities to each other as humans, as people, but also to the planet we live on and that we share with everybody else in the zoo here and outside. So thank you so much for listening, and I'm excited to hear the rest of the talks with you.